My name is Jennifer Goodman. I'm the director of the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance, and it's great to have you as a participant in this virtual session, this virtual gathering. Could folks mute if they're not uh, actively speaking, please? Uh, I think a lot of you know the Preservation Alliance is the statewide historic preservation nonprofit membership based group working all over the state. Um, this virtual session is part of our ongoing efforts to help. Um, people with all kinds of preservation related issues and topics. We've done a dozen or so since um, COVID hit and um, we've been tracking and adapting as we go. We'd love your feedback uh, during and after this session. Um, I think we've had some nice results to date. Uh, my colleague Beverly Thomas, who's on session in this session and I have been running the different ones. Uh, Beverly's been running old house ones, and I would think that there are um, better researched houses, drier basements, uh, well steward, more well stewarded houses, and um, at least one saved barn as the result of the session she's been running on old house and barn kind of topics. Um, and I've been working with community groups who uh, I think the folks on the call have, have, have uh, since since the participating have brought new tools to their heritage commissions, historical societies, uh, restarted fundraising efforts for endangered landmarks, things like that. So we're really about giving people, hopefully in these sessions, a few more ideas, a dose of inspiration, some idea of referrals, other folks to talk to. Um, just wanted to thank folks who are members and supporters of our work. If you're not already, please consider a donation or give a gift in somebody's honor. Um, most of our operating dollars come from people like you, and even a little bit makes a big difference. So again, thank you to those who are already supporters and hope you will if you aren't yet. Uh, we're definitely open for business, providing lots of kinds of assistance. Um, I wanna keep up doing uh, things that work uh, that we've been doing for a long time, as well as new things. Um, so again, the goal for this session in particular, as we've done in the past, is to try to answer some of your questions, give you a dose of practicality, also a dose of inspiration. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are recording this session. Um, please mute if you're not talking, just to keep out the ambient noise. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Roger La Rochelle and the Squam Lakes Conservation Society. They've been very committed to this topic of passing it on um, for important properties for years now. We have this date and this time for the session today um, because of Roger and the society's um, a routine of holding something in person around Squam on this day every year. We've loved being partners with that and love Roger's support and what that organization is doing around Squam and how we've been able to take some of those topics and ideas to other parts of the state. Um, mentioned uh, Beverly Thomas is here with me today. She does a lot of work with our um, uh, property owners around the state. I know a lot of you know her and have worked with her. She's also our program director. Um, and thank you to the, our, our panel, our uh, informal panelists today. We'll introduce you to them again later, but um, Bob Wilson, John Coolidge, and um, attorney Alexander Breed. Thanks for um, pull, helping us pull this topic together and sharing information. Um, I'm just going to say a few more minutes worth of context, and then the order is we're going to, after the context, um, hear some kind of personal portraits from Bob Wilson and then John Coolidge. Um, then Alexandra will um, jump in if it feels like the right time to sort of offer some context about um, legal and management strategies related to uh, property stewardship, and then we'll open it up for questions. So. Really, this is meant to be a discussion. Hope you have questions and suggestions for us um, in the second half of the program. Um, I don't know everybody on the call, but I wanted to offer that I think folks have a, a mix of topics and issues. I think we have folks that are both interested in summer property stewardship as well as stewardship for year-round properties. Um, some folks are thinking about it as um, stewardship in general. How do I protect this property into the future? How do I make sure it's cared after I'm gone? And then kind of within that, I think we have folks that are specifically looking at um, generational transfer, keeping it in the family 
uh, keeping property in the family. So I think it's a mix. Um, and I'm sure folks are at different places along the path of thinking about that and implementing different ideas. I know from the Preservation Alliance standpoint, we really think of the kinds of properties that you love as being so critical to what uh, makes New Hampshire really special. We think of them as vulnerable property types, um, summer camps and cottages in, in really um, attractive areas or obviously under a certain set of pressures, um, old farms and other legacy um, family properties have another set of challenges and opportunities associated with them. So we really, because I just wanted to say, really appreciate your interest in this topic and what you're doing um, to help steward these special project properties um, of your own or in your town or in your state. Um, I, I would just say um, three big picture concepts to get us going. Um, three steps that are pretty obvious ones to take when you're on this path of family property stewardship, property stewardship whether it's family property or, or not family property. Um, so three things. I think acknowledging, talking through the subject can be very challenging because if we're talking about the future, we're also talking about immortality and not being around forever. Um, I think if you're doing it kind of on your own or you're doing it with 30 family members, you just need to figure out the strategies to really um, tease out what's really important to you. Uh, what, is, what is important to you about this property to steward? What's significant about the property, maybe from a historic or, or a conservation perspective? Um, and what are the kind of Hi. challenges and opportunities? Come on in. Hello. Uh, secondly, just the concept of using experts. I know some of you have uh, connected. The Preservation Society. They're, they're probably hearing you. Is somebody chatting? I'm hearing a little background noise. Thanks. Uh, so um, talking about it, sort of teasing out what's important, the why, uh, using experts, um, financial experts, legal experts, folks that have gone through it before you, Checking in with conservation or preservation organizations obviously can be part of that mix. And then the third idea is just, you know, really making a plan, having a property succession plan, converting that vision into a working document, having a roadmap to go forward. So, and again, I think we'll talk about a mix of this today, but there's the, the why and making sure you understand the why before you figure out the how of, of family of property stewardship. So um, that was just meant to be a, a warm up and get us going. Um, we're going to hear now of two different great examples from different parts of the state. Um, there are many varied stewardship strategies once you figure out the why. Uh, Bob Wilson, Robert Wilson is here to sort of offer us a portrait of a, the use of a preservation easement. Uh, worked with the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance on that. Uh, Preservation Alliance is an individually crafted protection tool that's that's kind of the sister, so to speak, of a conservation easement. Um, Bob is a longtime friend of the Preservation Alliance, was an excellent board member, still doing committee work with us, also been a change maker sort of uh, board member with other cultural and historic organizations, including Canterbury Shaker Village. New Hampshire Historical Society, uh, Capital Center for the Arts, and more. I won't do any more. We'll spend the whole hour doing that. Bob, can you just um, chat a little bit about what brought you to New Hampshire and why your interest in historic properties? And then we'll get to your specific historic property in a minute. Well, thanks for I, being with us. I came to New Hampshire by invitation. Professionally, uh, I'm a retired oral surgeon and I was asked to come to Concord to practice. There were only two other oral surgeons in the state at the time, and that was in 1964. So I have lived now in New Hampshire since 1965 and came here from Buffalo, New York. And while I was in Buffalo, I lived around the corner from Frank Lloyd Wright's Martin House. And I've always sort of been interested in architecture historic architecture. And so coming to Concord uh, and now living in Hopkinton, 
Um, I, my wife and I really sort of always liked New England. We liked the atmosphere, the small town aspect. And so we set up shop, uh, practiced for 40 years, retired, and now s spend my time uh, trying to keep the paint on 371 Main Street in Hopkinton. <laughs> Should we look at that? And then maybe you can um, talk a little bit about how you got involved in this place. Whoops, I don't think I did it yet. Let's see, share screen, share. I'm always a little clunky on this. Here we go. There you go. Thank you. So why this place? Um, at the time, uh, my son was working in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, he'd been there for well over 10 years, uh, restoring old houses. Uh, that's sort of his passion. And he saw that this house uh, in the center of Hopkinton, next to the Cracker Barrel store, was for sale. And I happened to have the, um, had had the owner as a patient uh, for several years and knew the house. It was, she ran it as a rooming house. There, there was uh, added on to it uh, a very large wing that had two apartments in it. Uh, there was an attached shed. Uh, it was unfortunate. There were, where you see the picture where the, my son, who is currently the uh, director of the state's Division of Historic Resources, and who lives there now uh, in the Stanley Tavern. And when he saw that it was for sale, he said, Dad, he said, I, I think there's a, a wonderful house inside all that junk that's been added on to it. And he said, I wish you'd buy it and I'll restore it. And I said, but you, you live over a thousand miles away. He said, doesn't make any difference. He said, I really think it's worthwhile. Well, I didn't do anything for a while and the price kept coming down and no one was interested in it. And so finally, I called a friend of mine, uh, Max Farrow, who was a uh, historic preservation architect and asked him to do a busman's holiday for me and see if it was worth anything. And so he came, uh, he walked around, he said, well, for a house building that was built in 1791, he said it still has its original clapboards. And he said, yeah, it's been added on to. And when we went through the house, he said, it's also been built within. And he said, I really wonder if anything uh, is missing from the original fabric of the interior of the house, let alone the exterior. And so I bit the bullet and uh, bought the building and proceeded to, uh, under Ben's direction, uh, had people come and restore the building. They tore off the two porches, which you see on the side of the building where we're standing. Um, the front door, uh, the ar architrave over it and, and the the pilasters had rotted away. It was, it was pretty bad. And when we cleaned out the inside and and took down all the the various uh, rooms that have been created, lo and behold, there was the original tavern. Uh, the uh, tavern actually extends from one side of the building to the other. Uh, in the rear, there are two front parlors. Uh, one of which uh, the uh, Max Farrow said was really rather unique because they hid the corner posts uh, in the corners and have very elaborate uh, cornices around the uh, around the room and and then in the upstairs uh, when we sort of eliminated or tried to eliminate the closets we found that there were two hanging walls suspended from the ceiling that actually could be lifted up and create anywhere from one to three rooms. And indeed, uh, 
my friend D.B. Garvin at the New Hampshire Historical Society did some research and found an advertisement in the state newspaper uh, in Portsmouth advertising that the oh. New Hampshire Medical Society was going to meet at Stanley's Hall upstairs. And so all of that is intact. Nothing had been removed from the building. It had simply been built within. We took down the, uh, the addition that had the two apartments in it. Uh, we disconnected the shed from the uh, rest of the house. And when we did that, uh, we had a little surprise because the whole back corner of the entire building cracked. Oh, that's the sill just cracked and it dropped 18 inches. Oh. <laughs> and raising that up uh, was, uh, was really very interesting indeed. Oh. So Bob, this, these are definitely the after pictures. Thank you for, for offering the portrait of the before and the incredible work. Can I fast forward you to the, the decision about the easement and um, why that was important to you and your family? Well, Ben is eventually going to own this property. That's how we have set it up. So uh, it will eventually transfer to him after I'm gone. And the, the aspect of what we did to make this building what it is. Uh, Stanley Tavern was a, Theophilus Stanley was uh, a rather important person in Hopkinton during that period of time. Um, he's buried across the street in the old cemetery. And after you spend this kind of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, I, I will tell you, uh, you really want to be sure that what is going to remain isn't going to be monkeyed with and changed because once it's changed, once it's gone, it's gone. And you and no matter what kind of uh, recreation you do, it's not authentic. And that's what I like about this building. It's authentic. Mm -hmm. And one of the beams up in the attic that goes to the one of the giant king posts is written in the old script in white paint, this building built by Theophilus Stanley, 1791. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I said, bingo. And so uh, to preserve this, to maintain it as it is, and not have it be changed in the future, uh, it, it's, 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 I will say it really sparked other property owners in the main street of Hopkinton to do similar things to their houses as well. And it just upgraded the whole downtown, if you want to call it that, of Hopkinton. That's a great point. I might stop you there if that's okay, Bob. And I know during the discussion, we could probably come back to some specifics. Is that okay? Oh, sure. I, the other thing I want to say is why I had New Hampshire Preservation Alliance do this preservation easement. Uh, having been on the board and knowing the staff as I did, I had confidence that the competence of the staff would maintain this easement without any problem. Thanks for that plug. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop the share. Thank you so much, Bob, for that, those initial thoughts. Um, here we're back and I'm gonna segue to John now. John, do you want me to pull up that first map? I, I would uh, introduce sure. you just generally by saying that you and your family's conservation efforts um, are really deeply intertwined with the history of the Squam area and the history of conservation efforts in the Squam area. And I think like Bob, we're really so fortunate to have um, you and your family as just incredible assets for your property, but also the states. I sort of, I, I think I said it too, I feel like you're the Johnny Appleseed of uh, this kind of venture, <laughs> sharing the world. So thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you for what you've done for your property. I, I, I take very little credit for all that. It's my ancestors basically that set this up. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I'm a software engineer. I worked originally in the, in the dot-com world until it went very south. And then I joined Mass Audubon as the stewardship director uh, for land protection. Um, I grew up in a house that was owned by John Goddard, 
who was the wagon master for George Washington and enjoyed, you know, ceilings or the attic boards that were three and four feet wide and an old house that basically was unchanged since his time. Um, anyway, I'll segue into my little spiel here about Hogue Island and the family. It's a, similar to what I did a couple of years ago with Roger, I think on the original Passing It On that we did. Um, but basically, I'm uh, one of three trustees of the Hogue Island Preservation Trust. It's a nonprofit voluntary corporation in New Hampshire. Um, I'm one of the sixth generation of family whose forebearers were fortunate to acquire a fair amount of land around Squam in the late 1800s. Uh, and because of those prior generations, we've all been extremely blessed and spoiled by this wonderful place that a lot of us now call home. Uh, in the 1880s, two of my great 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 uncles, uh, while in their teens, spent time at uh, summer camp, uh, Camp Shikaror on Squam. And it was one of the first uh, camps, residential camps, on the lake back in that day. Unfortunately, it only lasted a few years through 1881, 1898. Uh, now known as Church Island. There are services there or work every Sunday. Um, several years later, both as young men, they returned uh, to Squam and Harold Jefferson Coolidge purchased several islands, Long, Utopia, and Duck Island, which are primarily still in ownership of the family. Um, and his brother, Julian, uh, purchased Hogue Island uh, for $525 back in, <laughs> in 1882, I think it was, 1883. Um, next year, they persuaded their parents, Joseph Randolph, uh, to purchase the Smith Farm. Uh, at the time was over 300 acres. And that was the first mainland property the family purchased uh, in Sandwich. It's now known as Coolidge Farm. John, do you want me they, to show the first map? I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you want me to show the first map while you're doing this? Wanna, sh sure, either way. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, they and other family members purchased additional uh, land and several other farms that were abutting in the area throughout the early 1890s, 1900s. In the early days, several of these were leased and continued to operate as farms. Others were restored and used by the family. Um, several of the brothers were also very involved in forestry and the stewardship of the land, and they built a small sawmill on the backside of Squaw Cove uh, to enable themselves to build camps for themselves and other friends and members of the family around the lake. And the property basically became one of the first country estates in the area and Sandwich, and was called Upper Asquam Farms. And that map shows a good deal of it. Uh, also off to the left, there was some more land there. Uh, skipping ahead several dec decades until the late 1960s, after several parcels had been sold off, um, one of my grandfather's brothers, Roger Coolidge, who had inherited a fair amount of land and felt very strongly about the land preservation, donated a large parcel to the New Hampshire Forest Society. And that's the lower left-hand corner, if you see on that map. Um, and it's called, I think, the, the Roger Coolidge Preserve or the Larger Coolidge Tree Farm. That led, uh, amongst several years, of several other families do members donating properties and others in the area, and a great deal of effort done by Roger and the Squam Lake Conservation Society, which has now preserved over 2,000 acres in this area. The latest one up in the upper right hand corner, which uh, I'm extremely thrilled about because it ties in a lot of the other properties and some wonderful trails in there. If you see that little P there, that's a, a very new little parking area for half a dozen cars and you can walk into Lost Lake, which is probably one of the best trails I've ever been on in the Lakes region. It's just exquisite. And you see animals, all sorts back in Lost Lake up in there. And there are other trails through there. Anyway, about the same time, uh, my grandfather, who had been given Hogue Island back in the 1928s by his uncle, created what was known or became known as the Hogue Island Preservation Trust. It's an entity that my grandfather, ba grandparents basically used to pass on the ownership of the island to their grandchildren with the hopes that the future generations could join the, enjoy the land as they all had. The trust in the early days was set up um, 
through then and all became the idea of the trust, I'm sorry, was set up the idea that we all, when we reached a responsible age, and if and when we had the financial ability, we could all build our own camps. Little at the time did we realize what a gift and a burden this could be. There were 14 of us in our early 20s to my youngest cousin who was four. The trust will celebrate its 50th anniversary this month with a virtual celebration and with luck we'll all be actually gathering next year. Hogue Island is about 112 acres. There are three camps in private ownership. Um, you can put that other map up which shows the, the picture of the island if you want. You, um, the trust itself is a New Hampshire voluntary corporation. Not really a trust as such, though that's what we refer to as one. We operate under a set of bylaws, articles of agreement, and as a business, uh, mainly supported by and with a lot of family volunteers. And I can't overemphasize that. Every single member of the trust puts in a, a huge amount of time, either cleaning camps, scheduling, or whatever needs to be done. Our annual meetings can last for hours as everybody has lots to say, discuss, and talk about. Okay. The trust owns two additional camps, which we rent to friends, extended family, and ourselves to help offset expenses. In the early days of the trust, my dad and grandmother served as lifetime trustees with a cousin of my grandmother's to fill the first vacancy. From the onset, the objectives and purposes of the trust were to preserve and maintain the natural environment of the island. Numerous changes in its legal structure have been made in the intervening years. There have been some missteps. The trust had originally been incorporated in Massachusetts, and when tax laws changed, we found ourselves being taxed as a Massachusetts corporation, with each shareholder having to report their share of any profit or loss at the time. And at that time, it was 46 cents per individual. <laughs> Not to mention having to hire accountants and whatnot to figure it out. It was fairly cumbersome. It was recommended by a New Hampshire attorney that since the land we were, were all entrusted with was in New Hampshire, why were we not a New Hampshire trust, land trust? Uh, this was quickly approved by all the members at that time. And once incorporated in New Hampshire, we strengthened the preservation objectives, made a more democratic process. We added preservation to our name. Uh, we created standing committees, encouraging involvement. The trustees are now elected by the membership for three-year terms. The trustees appoint and oversee lead individuals to help manage most of the functions of the trust, such as the treasurer, um, secretary, rental scheduling, maintenance, boats, et cetera. These managers are urged to reach out to the younger generation uh, for apprentices in an effort to keep people involved and also take part. We have an organized twice a year, uh, spring and fall cleanup, if you will, open up. Um, we also created an executive committee with representatives of each of the four families to help review the annual budgets and encourage the two-way communications between the membership and the trustees. Controls over the ownership of shares was established to encourage the transfer to the younger generations and to ensure that they understood the, and supported the objectives of the trust. An important secondary benefit was to reduce the likelihood of estate taxes in the event of a member's death. And consequently, these required, or consent of these requires a two thirds approval from all outstanding shares. Also, we changed the threshold for dissolution, the sale of the property to three quarters of the outstanding shares. These all took many discussions over time and eventually were passed by the members. One of the most meaningful changes that we did a number of years ago was a bargain sale of a conservation restriction to the Squam Lake Conservation okay. Trust. Permanently preserving the 92 acres of the undeveloped land that the trust owned on the back side of the island. And that you see in that drawing there, that's what's surrounded in the purple lines there. Okay. The process took Looking back seemed quite simple at the time to many of us. However, it became very complicated with everyone with different opinions as to what it all meant. And the process took many twists and turns besides many years from where it first proposed. At the time, there were 33 beneficiaries. As I said, three quarters of whom had to approve any disposition of the property. Giving up a perceived right to build a camp, possibly in the future, 
Oops, lost my page here. Uh, and with a fairly, fairly wide diverse group and extended family members with occupations all over the world, people getting to agree on something forever seemed next to impossible. Early on, there were extensive discussions of the potential future development, the number of possible building sites for future development, the thoughts of selling a building site to help endow the trust. Uh, and there were, there were many, many other options that came up from everyone. Um, also, what should be permanently protected? Everybody had those special places that we all explored around as children. Bear Rock, which is right opposite Jumping Rock. If you've been on Squam, that's a very popular place. Also, the back beaches. Partway through all of this, several members created a rather lengthy survey asking us all what we saw as the future of the island and what our individual dreams were, along with our favorite memories, place, and I think even our favorite ice cream. When everybody looked at the results, there was a very strong feeling that any more building or development would change the feeling of the place, not just for us, who had been spoiled by it all these years, but for everybody around the lake who picnic on the back beaches, swam at Bear Rock, or picked blueberries along the shore. What emerged, though, throughout all the discussion and all the what ifs, was that it wouldn't be the same. When the actual vote was taken, 33 members of the, whole, of the shareholders all unanimously voted to approve the easement. And what, what it came down to for many of us was the best way to preserve and steward the land was to leave it basically as it had been left to us and hopefully better for the next generation and to enjoy and share. There are currently 44 shareholders and at least a dozen more potential ones just beginning to enjoy the island. And roughly 40% of the shares are held by my generation and the rest are now held by the next two generation. That's my, that's our story. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, John. Happy to help one, answer any questions. <laughs> one other photo, here's. Oh yeah, that's, that's a photo of the island taken from the rattlesnakes looking, looking in the backside. Sorry. Off to the right is Bear Rock and Jumping Rock, and sort of two thirds of the way down on the left is where the back beaches are. Um, and a couple of weekends ago, I counted 45 boats back in there, all picnicking and enjoying the, the water and the scenery and the blueberries. That's great. That's great. That's really nice. Wonderful. Alexander, would you thank you so much, John and, and Bob? Alexander, do you feel like jumping in and offering a little? perspective on strategies now? Do you want to wait and hear what questions people have? Or what do you want to do? I, th I think it'd be useful to hear questions from people okay. and I'd be happy to jump in if there's something that could be added um, from a legal perspective. I think the whole Hogue Island Trust is a little different than um, a, what we would consider a fam family compound trust that's developed for the, per for the specific purpose of keeping property in the bloodline of a family. Um, as the, as the Coolidge's have done, but um, I, it, correct me if I'm wrong, John, I don't think all of you have the right to use the island subject to the various rules and prohibitions and whatever, but I don't think any of you own an interest that is then includable in your estate, for instance, when you die. I think, I think those interests have been given up, as I, as I recall that trust document. Basically, yes. Uh, we each own shares of the trust, and if all the members agreed, we could sell it and would obviously profit from that sale. But because there are so many of us and the high criteria of three quarters of the members agreeing, as I said, there is a potential uh, right now of 50 plus members. Um, they'd all, you know, three quarters of them would have to agree. So yes, it's, it transfers down through the bloodline, but in actuality, it's going to be next to impossible. At least that's our hope uh, right. that we'll preserve it um, in the going into the future. So, and I think the big thing of everybody was we realized that when there were 50 of us all vying to build a camp somewhere, and this is way down the line, that really it's the enjoyment and the sharing of it that is the most important thing to the family. I mean, we have three camps that are owned individually by individual family members, but they're all shared by multiple generations. And that was really the important thing, I think, to everybody to preserve that. 
complicated piece of land. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 And I love the themes of, of the why that you describe throughout the, both the personal and sort of the community piece. Um, also the, the strategies, the survey, the, how you figure out, um, you know, coalescing, uh, coming up with some decisions um, when you have many diverse folks all over the, the country and world. Uh, Megan, did you, somebody had a question, let me look. Um, question for Alexandra about deed restrictions. Are you reading that too, Alexandra? My husband and I don't have any children. We live in an old house. Can we amend our deed with a restriction regarding no demolition? You want to take that, Alexandra? And uh, I think that is a, a common thing that we talk to people about with the deed versus easement and um, how to protect a property into the future. Um, I think the short answer is it would be difficult without granting an interest to an organization like the Preservation Alliance or, or uh, Conservation Trust to sort of own that, that right to um, pr protect the property and uh, enforce the right to uh, demolish the building of a future owner. So it, it's a, it gets into complicated sort of property law concepts of restricting your own property, um, which we probably don't need to go into today, but um, I mean, there may be a way to do it, but I don't think you can just simply prepare a deed and say to yourself, you can't prepare a deed from yourself to yourself with a restriction in it. There's got to be some other entity probably involved in that, um, that process. Okay. And that the question preservation, preservation easements are analogous to conservation easements, as I said earlier. In terms of the landscape, the Preservation Alliance is very interested in talking to property owners, whether or not we accept the easement, um, we're interested in talking through the concepts with you. Um, uh, in terms of the players on the preservation easement stage, I think we're, we're the clearest proactive one working statewide, the Preservation Alliance is. There's some local heritage commissions that um, have accepted preservation easements. There's also the regional group, Historic New England, that does have some easements in New Hampshire. So anyways, I can talk to you more about um, who the players are, but that's that's a first little snapshot. And, um, and reinforcing what Alexandra said, that the easement design and construct is more readily uh, designed to help you meet your goals, I think, than a deed restriction. Okay. Other questions about easements or other things? Maybe not. They're individually crafted. Um, I know uh, Bob talked a little bit about the the what they found when they peeled back the later layers, and certainly um, that was attractive not only to Bob and his family to protect, but the Preservation Alliance as well. The great um, the tavern doors. I always go like this. <laughs> the walls that come up, the swinging walls. Um, the, the detail of the um, woodwork and the hardware and the um, fireplace surrounds and everything in that tavern are cr truly um, significant and intact. So in that case, our easement actually does protect those features. In other easements, there's no protections inside the property. Again, they're individually crafted, really meant to help meet the owner's wishes, they all, we also kind of take an academic view of what's significant about the property. And then we always look at issues of viability and flexibility over time too, because the current property owner that we're working with and the Preservation Alliance are both interested in making sure that the- Jennifer? Find that balance of it being protected, but also viable over time. Bob? Jennifer, I think one of the things that um, I found working with the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance was and in easements in general uh, is the fact that if someone has a property and they want to uh, have an easement on it, you can select what you want the easement to cover. Uh, in the case of the tavern, not all of the interior is covered in the easement. 
because one of the things, if it was going to be uh, a place for a family to live, they had to have modern bathrooms. <laughs> they had to have a, a kitchen that was functional. And, and so, uh, well, a good portion of the interior of the tavern is protected by the easement. You can, you can actually select, you could have just the exterior. You could have, you know, one room simply be part of the easement. And so I think that people who are thinking about this and they're saying, well, you know, what, uh, what should be preserved within the easement, it's really your own choice. That in, in conference, in, cons in consulting with the Alliance, uh, to make sure that what you are preserving is worth it. Yeah, thank you for saying that. And Greg had kind of asked a related question. Um, um, I think what's typical for us is that we would say that the easement would prohibit um, the demolition of a historic significant house, maybe an outbuilding, maybe prohibit um, development in a certain place if it was a, a um, uh, the property had um, was a summer place or was a farm where the landscape was integral to the structures. We might say the development could not go certain places. Certain set of things would be at, allowed as of right. You can do it, <laughs> permitted. Don't need to check in with anything, anybody before you do it. And then there's typically a section of the easement where um, there's there's guidance about what's protected and what's allowed, and you the property owner, the one that makes the donation in the first place, and then the easement passes to future owners. So those future owners in that section would have to come to the Preservation Alliance, um, the easement holder, to get permission for certain things. So if you need a new roof, uh, you have a reason to change the sill, uh, maybe you do want to um, add a, an outbuilding in a certain area that's related to that section of the easement, and that we use the Secretary of Interior standards, some really practical common sense preservation standards as the guidelines to review and make those decisions. So, um, so yes, to individually customized, uh, it's a give and take to decide what's in and what's out, what's protected, what's not, as Bob said. And then the easement itself is crafted to have a set of things that are total no's, can't do it, can't demolish the house, a set of things that are allowed as of right, and then this middle section, I think of it as things you need to get permission for. It feels a little bit like being in a local historic district if people have a sense of that. And there's clear guidance around um, how we make those decisions. So uh, I give you, if I gave you an easement, that's kind of like giving you the rights to, so you would look after it. So if I'm not there, that's your kind, that's what, like giving it to New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. Yeah, yeah. So then if yeah. someone tried to do something, you would be there looking after it to make sure they don't do it. Right. We're protecting the preservation values that get determined as part of the process. Okay. Yeah. In perpetuity is the Thank main you. issue Thanks, there. Um, can hmm. I just add one comment about the question that came up earlier about a private restriction? Sure. Um, there is an ability to put a private restriction on your property. However, it's called an easement and gross, unless it's attached to another piece of land that can enforce it. And it would only last during your lifetime. So the person, I'm sorry, I don't know who it was who asked the question. If you conveyed the property, you could retain the right to say, I don't want to demolish during my lifetime or my lifetime and my spouse's lifetime. Um, and that would probably be enforceable if somebody's around to enforce it but it's not in perpetuity is the main issue. If you want in perpetuity, you have to deal with another organization to, that's able to enforce that restriction. So I just wanted to add that as a subtext. And that's, that's one of the things that we did with the Hog Island Trust by giving the easement to the Conservation Society, they're the enforcers going down the future generation. We have certain, and correct me Alexander if I'm wrong, but the wording I think is a reserved right to do a forest management plan, for instance, which allows us to cut a limited number of trees over a limited period of time. Um, but basically, the society will enforce the rights. So if we do something wrong or a future landowner does something wrong, they're the ones that basically have the authority to come in and correct it. Uh, they own the development rights in, a, in theory. 
Yeah, right. So, so you all still own the interest in the land, the property interest. It can do on the property whatever you wish, minus whatever you've already given up to to the right. Swan Lakes Conservation Trust. So that's that's correct. Yeah. 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 Does anybody on the in this gathering besides John, maybe Alexandra, you do too. This is a this is a packed group, but already have a conservation easement on their property? Does anybody? We often have worked with property owners that had a conservation easement on their land for obvious reasons related to wanting to protect open space or natural resources, but they um, didn't have any protection on the, the house itself. It comes up a lot with um, farms and with um, um, summer places. So if we're just... Go ahead. Sorry, Jennifer, I was just gonna interject here a little bit. We have an easement on Coolidge Farm on the land, and we are in the early discussions of doing a preservation historical easement on the farmhouse itself. And the basic thought is that we wanna protect the, the look and the feel of the farm and not necessarily restrict what could be happening inside. Yep. Um, we've got a lot of the old beams we'd like to protect, but you know, future owners of it may have an entirely different way of they want to use the building, you know, obviously, but the look and feel of driving by and seeing it from the lake or the hills, whatnot, that's what's really important to the current beneficiaries or the current owners of it. And that's what we're trying to do. But and that becomes pretty complicated. <laughs> well, and thanks. also the enforcement of it. The, yeah, the enforcement yeah. of the yeah. burden on the various agencies that whoever you end up giving those Yep. rights too. Yep. Thanks for mentioning that. And I can send around an article to everybody afterwards. Um, there is some resource material. I'll send everybody afterwards. But what I just that made me think of the um, other work that the Squam Lake Conservation Society has done with preservation easements. Um, and really, to your point about the look and feel um, for summer properties, uh, back to the question of you know why or what's important and what the historic significance is the kind of um, uh, the the way the old camps related to the lake kind of disappeared had natural materials were small and sort of a low impact on land use around the lake was something I know that um, that great task force that worked in association with the society really identified and we're looking for a preservation easement model that really um, helped protect that look and feel without kind of having a more curatorial approach to protecting all of the physical architectural elements of the place. So there's a nice model around SWAM that Preservation Alliance helped with and is happy to help take around the state too, where it's, it's really about the, um, the, the look and feel, as John said, you know. Yeah. Um, I think they call them Campstead easements. Campstead easements. Right, and yeah, it's a very cool. unique um, it's a very unique document that was developed yeah. by SLCS and Preservation Alliance. It's been talked about at the Land Trust Alliance National Group on easements. It's it's a very it's a very unique method yeah. of preserving yeah. these camps. Yeah, it's going like camps. And I'm I'm sure there. I I mean I know there are others around the country that have done similar things. But you know the camps on Squam are unique, and there aren't any of them around. In other places, and that's a lot of what the current owners feel. They want to preserve the look and feel of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you know, we're I'm speaking from a historic preservation group, so obviously I care about uh, the history. Back to the kind of knowing what you have. Um, I mean, there's families we've talked to that don't want to take the step of an easement, and maybe aren't. Um, are or aren't passing it on to a future generation, but. Um, a very simple building block that we would recommend is is just getting all of your history and knowledge in one place, right? That's such a basic building block to pass on that information to the next generation, even if you're not passing on a property with a legal protection on it. Um, so, you know, we can help folks with that. We have programs on researching the history of your house. Um, some folks might want to um, move towards having a state um, a nomination to the State Register of Historic Places or even the National Register of Historic Places. 
um, using one of those official formats and official designation um, that are primarily honorific, but they are also just force you to get all your material together and then again be able to pass that on for future generations. So um, basic research, documentation, having it all in one place, giving it to your family members for a Christmas present or making sure it, it um, goes to the local historical society is another sort of theme of this legacy work, right? That's again, not a, an official legal tool, but is um, a useful aid and sort of a gift to future generations. So Preservation Alliance can help with that kind of work too, if, if that's something of interest, a basic building block. So I'm interested in knowing, does anybody in the call um, have if what I would refer to as a legacy property, a you know, family property, maybe not as much of a legacy as John Coolidge's Oak Island, which has been owned for what, five generations, John, um, but properties that uh, they think are unique and they want to make sure get passed on to their usually children uh, with certain restrictions as to further transfers outside of the family members and that sort of thing. Um, because that's, I think that's a very common issue that folks face uh, that have uh, legacy properties, could be a farm, could be on Swan Lake, could be on the seacoast, uh, you know, could be any, anything uh, that people feel is really strongly. They want to make sure it gets to their family members and they want to have certain restrictions on that transfer. I don't know if that's something that's of interest to people to talk about or not. We don't now, but may in the future. Yeah, yeah. So what? There are some materials that Jennifer's going to, you're going to send around that outline, Jennifer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I prepared an outline a couple of years ago. Note that the tax references are not up to date because it was prepared in, in 2017. Uh, but it might be useful uh, materials just to have available just as the other resource materials are that Jennifer mentioned. Yeah. We do get calls from folks who are, you know, minutes away from going into a family meeting at the end of the summer and they're <laughs> uh, they're concerned because next generation is, you know, um, <laughs> spread out. Not spread out. Thank you. And um, they're worried about paying their property tax bill, um, and they have questions about estate issues, estate tax issues. So um, I'm sure you get that all the time, Alexandra, and try to walk people through. Maybe not the 24-hour call, but <laughs> I work with a lot of people that have have these properties. Yes. <laughs> Those are common issues, right? The short-term operating costs, as well as the planning ahead, so you're not right and dealing yeah. with, you know, uh, children of different resources and means. Some who can, you know live on the West Coast, they only come to you know Squam Lake one week a year. Or they don't feel like they can or should be paying as much as somebody who comes up here every weekend. Yeah. You know, I mean, just all that kind of stuff that goes on with, you know, with trying to develop a mechanism for the ownership and management of property and it's it's transfer you know in the future or restrictive transfer and that's true so yeah those all the time my name is think, Larry. Yeah. I think if I I think Lawrence do we go from to Lawrence and then back to Bob my name's Larry hi I'm a neighbor and a friend of John's um, I was brought to Swam Lake as a boy and my children and my grandchildren have and are growing up on the lake. We own a number of properties, including our main camp, which is 100 years old and which we renovated. Uh, to, fortunately, the original owners are our next door neighbors. <laughs> Their mother were married, was ma married in front of our fireplace. Um, and so we had lots of information and pictures about restoring the property the way it was, which we were happy about. And we've attended a number of these meetings, read all the books and materials that, that the Preservation Alliance and the, the Conservation Society provided. In fact, we provided a library of them for the Conservation Society. And our family has already developed a range of programs that would um, prevent any sale of any of our properties on Squam outside the family. And uh, we've, we've, we've learned a lot from John and John's family uh, and from others on the lake. Unfortunately, we've learned also from some of the problems that some of our friends around the lake have had with their families. And um, 
done a lot of work in governance, which is an area that I spend time on outside the lake. Mm. Uh, a lot of, of work on governance to try to figure out ways um, to anticipate potential problems and to provide tools and, um, and processes to help um, people come together and use their shared experience as a family to also understand their shared uh, legacy here. So I just thought I'd share that briefly. Thank you for that. Larry, do you have currently in your, is your property currently in some form of a management entity or? or yes, uh, yeah, our, our, we have four properties in a boathouse property. We, and they are all currently owned in a, in a, in a limited, in New Hampshire limited corporation. Um, and we're dividing them up into individual LLCs and the trust that cares for them and that is owned by the family members own shares in each of the, own shares currently in the broader LLC and will own shares in each individual LLC. And um, there are funds and processes to fund that trust to be able to maintain the properties multi-generationally. And there's a, a set of governance documents around both the properties themselves and also the trust that enable for share transfers within the family, but for no shares to be able to be sold outside the family. Right. Yep. Thank you very, thought very thoughtfully and thoroughly uh, managed and prepared. That's good. Bob, did you have a something you to add? Right. Yes, I I know we've been talking about preserving these properties to pass them on to future generations within the family. Uh, quite honestly, I think someone looking to preserve their property doesn't necessarily have to think about passing it on to fa other family members. Uh, I think I'd just be rather selfish in saying this property is important. I don't want anything to happen to it. Uh, and so I'm gonna put a preservation easement on it. I don't care who owns it because that preservation easement carries on forever. Unless the house burns down, uh, nothing is gonna happen to it because I know the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance is gonna send around somebody annually to make sure that, I, that the current owner hasn't screwed things up. Good advertisement, thank you. <laughs> that's true. That, and similar that's sort of what I want you me to stop and leave this. That tool is the, that tool is helpful whether it to be winding up very soon. It stays in or goes out of a family for sure. And the researching and getting your act together on that front is important, well, whether it's staying in the family or going out of the family as well. <clears throat> Anybody else have uh, questions or suggestions? We should do a shout out to Roger who joined us. Hello, Roger. Your ears should have been ringing. There were lots of uh, positive comments about your commitment to this topic and the great work of your organization over time. There we go. Larry's got his t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks for continuing the conversation. And we all have a lot to learn from each other. And uh, we're, we're glad that you're carrying the banner forward this year. So thank you. Good. I hope next summer we're back together along the lake on this day. <laughs> Anybody else? Kelly, did you have any questions relating to your situation? You're muted. I know. I, I've just unmuted myself. Okay. No, this has been interesting to hear. Okay. Thank Good. you. Good. Well, I'll wrap it up then. Thank you so much to um, our speakers for um, participating today and um, offering their personal portraits, Bob and John, as well as um, Alexandra has been a great resource to um, families across the state and we've appreciated her work on our preservation easement committee for sure. Thanks again to Roger and the Squam Lakes Conservation Society for carrying the banner on this topic for so many years and for their innovative work around Squam. Um, just um, 
I'm going to send around um, an email afterwards to all the participants. Please um, give us your feedback. There's a really simple survey. We'd love you to fill it out. Um, as I mentioned before, I will send around a number of um, handout resources um, that hopefully will be useful to you. Um, probably some more useful to others, depending on where you are in the process and what your end game goals are. Um, so, and there's other Preservation Alliances programs coming up in the fall. Roger, anything? You do, are you doing a virtual annual meeting? Or do you already do it? Uh, we are uh, next Saturday, and we're gonna culminate it with an hour of darkness, um, August 15th. So our annual meeting's at 9 a.m. and then at 9 p.m. We're asking the whole watershed to turn off oh. all artificial lights. Uh, throughout the watershed for an hour. So it'll be interesting to see if uh, we can uh, return to dark skies uh, for a period of time. Well, what a cool thing. Okay. So Darken and Squam and other places around the, the state and um, thanks for being enlightening <laughs> to the Preservation <laughs> Alliance and each other today. Um, stay safe, stay healthy and stay in touch everybody. Thanks a lot for participating. Thank you, Jennifer. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly.